Thank you, sir. At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity. I'm going to speak today on uh, multifocal IOLs and toric IOLs. Basically, multifocal IOLs are designed to reduce the dependence on glasses, both for distance and near. And it is one of the options, refractive options, for both cataract and refractive surgeons. Normally, the monofocal lenses give, provide excellent distant vision. But with the advent of the multifocal IOLs, both the cataract and refractive surgeons are able to provide a full range of uncorrected vision to the patients. Broadly, the multifocal IOLs are classified into refractive, diffractive, and a combination of these. The refractive IOLs are, of course, not in use today. The resume lenses were being used previously. The basic difference between these two lenses is that the refractive lenses produce multiple focal images, focal points, whereas the diffractive lenses produce only two focal uh, points, both for distance and near. The diffractive multifocal IOLs, they use the uh, principle of Fresnel diffraction, uh, diffraction optics, in which about uh, uses uh, light diffraction at an interface grid to separate the incoming light into two focal points. About 82% of the light is uh, being split into uh, half into both near and distant images, and the remaining 18% is scattered and lost. So basically, in the diffractive uh, multifocal IOLs, the spherical overall spherical shape of the lens produces an image for the distant vision, and the step structure produces the image for the near vision. So the basic uh, the difference between the diffractive and the refractive lenses are that diffractive lenses provide excellent near vision and a good distant vision with a fair intermediate vision, and they are pupil independent, whereas the refractive lenses provide better intermediate vision and is pupil dependent. The diffractive lenses which are available today are the restore lenses, which is actually a combination of both diffractive and refractive lens. It has an apodized design, which means that there is a gradual tapering of the steps, and this uh, it has a refractive uh, power for the distance and di diffractive for the near. There are around 12 rings which are present in the central 3.6 millimeters and the peripheral rings are closer to each other. And these uh, steps actually reduce from 1.3 microns in the center to around 0.2 microns in the periphery. And the larger steps actually direct more light to the near and the smaller steps direct more light to the distance. The technis multifocal IOL differs from the uh, restore in that the anterior surface has a more of a spherical, uh, provides spherical uh, surface, whereas the steps are provided on the posterior surface. And it gives an add of plus four, which translates to around 3.5 on the spectacles. Now you have these Acri uh, Lisa lenses, which are square edged haptic with the optic, and uh, these lenses are bifocal, biconvex, uh, they provide bifocal and biconvex aberration correcting uh, technology. And coming to the symphony lenses which have been introduced recently, they are also uh, another modification of Technus IOL. This uses three optical approaches to maximize the quality of vision while providing up to 2.5 diopters of usable uh, focus. So in this, the first one is that it provides aspheric surface profile, which provides a negative spherical aberration, which uh, negates the positive spherical aberration of the cornea and gives better contrast sensitivity. It elongates the depth of focus. And instead of the light being split into multiple focus or two focal points, here it provides an elongated depth of focus. And this is independent of the pupil and the light conditions. And third, it uh, actually has a proprietary uh, achromatic technology which uh, negates these chromatic uh, aberrations. So these uh, symphony lenses are, have two important properties. One has a proprietary Echelet design uh, which extends this uh, range of uh, depth of focus and the second is a proprietary achromatic technology. So the basic uh, difference between this and the other IOLs is that it uh, neutralizes chromatic abrasion, it corrects uh, the spherical abrasion, and it is pupil independent, and it has a full diffractive posterior surface, and it is not associated with glistenings, and the halos are also considered to be less with this type of IOL. 
So now we have been trying this uh, monomicrovision where we aim at uh, emetropia in the dominant eye and if the patient wants more of near vision, we try to uh, undercorrect and give minus 0.5 for the uh, non-dominant eye. Basically, achieving spectacle independence is quite uh, challenging and choosing the lifestyle IOLs is even more challenging. Not every IOL is suitable for every patient due to the complexity of the lifestyle, the personality dynamics and the anatomy and physiology of the eye. So the most important preoperative diagnostic evaluation is the astigmatism management. The multifocal IOLs perform best when the astigmatism is less than 0.75 diopters. So keratometric readings are very important. The manual keratometry is most important. And if uh, the readings are less than 40 or more than 47, then you have to consider doing a topography. And the uh, K reading often correlates poorly with the refraction. So always take into account the corneal keratometric value. The, uh, biometry is again very important in this. The optical axial measurements are more accurate than the ultrasound measurements. And the immersion ultrasound measurements are more accurate compared to the A scan. The topography is done to look for the regularity of the astigmatism and the teofilm quality and look for anterior corneal abrasions to rule out any third or fourth order uh, abrasions like coma and spherical abrasions. The optical coherence tomography or the OCT is done to rule out any macular pathology. A good macular function is required to achieve normal reading function. Now, intraocular uh, lens formulas, the normal usual lens formulas are used. And uh, coming to the preoperative counseling and patient selection, the patient should be warned of the optical abrasions and any uh, chances of uh, enhancements which, which need to be treated and neuroadaptation. They should be warned of the inherent risks of the surgery and also the potential of halos which may persist for some time. The suitability of any individual for multifocal IOL depends on the patient's lifestyle and his visual ex expectations. So selection of the IOLs is based on the functional benefits and its limitations. The patients should also be explained about the potential for post-operative enhancements with either piggyback IOL or any corneal refractive surgery. So patient selection is one of the most challenging aspects of multifocal IOL and it's more of an art than science. There are certain positive characteristics which you should keep in mind before selecting the patients for multifocal IOLs. Patients with, uh, who need spectacle independence, easygoing personality, those who can accept small powers, and those whose near work is mo mostly of reading nature, and moderate to uh, high hyperopes often perform well with multifocals. And those with, uh, who do not mind wearing glasses, hypercritical patients with unrealistic expectations, and sharp, clear vision, those who expect sharp, clear vision, you must try to avoid these lenses. Coming to the certain contraindications, corneal diseases like dry eye and uh, uh, dysfunction, uh, mebumin glass dysfunction should be treated, and uh, certain pupillary conditions like these should be avoided, and of course, macular problems, you must try to avoid multifocal eye oils. Intraocular, intraoperative procedures like, I mean, issues like uh, very well-centered and uh, uh, properly sized capsular X is extremely important with a three degree, 360 degree overlap. And uh, managing unhappy patients, uh, multifocal patients is extremely important. You should listen to them carefully, address to their problems. The blurred vision could be due to posterior capsular opacification, dry eye, or CME. So a complete clinical examination should be done. So I'll just rush through these. To sum up, uh, these pa multifocal patients can achieve spectacle in independence. So a proper patient education about the benefits and side effects of multifocal IOLs is very important. Because these multifocal IOLs often react to even minor ocular abrasions, complete pre-operative clinical evaluation is extremely important. And these patients, in spite of good counseling and proper selection, may experience unsatisfactory outcomes. So a suitable post-operative management of both satis uh, satisfied and unsatisfied patients is extremely important. Coming to the toric IOL, 20% of the patients who undergo cataract surgery have 1.25 diopters of astigmatism, and these patients need toric IOL. So before counseling a patient for cataract surgery, you must do a keratometric to rule out any uh, astigmatism. 
So the critical success in these patients depends upon, again, patient selection, preoperative measurement and IOL calculation. So here, all these I have just mentioned for uh, multifocal IOL. This is the um, toric IOL calculator, which is available online. You have to feed in these data, and uh, they provide us with the um, point where the incision has to be made and the steep axis of the lens where the lens has to be placed. These are the instruments which are necessary to implant a toric IOL. And this is how uh, the pre-op uh, toric uh, reference marker which is being used, volume. So this bubble marker is used to uh, mark the three, zero, three uh, 9 and 12 o'clock positions. Uh, this can be on the slit lamp, it can be done. Uh, This is, how, uh, this is the axis uh, marker which is uh, being placed after the patient is taken to the operating theater. So once the axis marker is placed, uh, the uh, cataract surge is a uh, uh, toric IOL being uh, implanted. So here you can see the first uh, axis marker uh, is being applied uh, with the uh, axis marker both uh, on the two sides. And this has to be uh, done just before starting the surgery, and it should not be very broad because it may affect, uh, may affect the visualization also. And once the cataract is uh, removed, uh, the, the most important part is the rexis should be circular and complete. And once the cortical matter and uh, this thing is cleared up, the eye oil, here in this case, the acrylic uh, toric eye oil is being implanted into the bag. And you have to make sure that the axis lies about 20 to 30 degrees short of the expected uh, axis. And once uh, this is placed in the bag, uh, with the irrigation on from one port, you can gradually dial the lens into position. And before that, you have to make sure that you clean up the entire viscoelastic, both from the front and from behind the lens. And uh, once the lens is in position, you can make out the marks coinciding with the axis marks. The antechamber is then reformed, and you have to just look for the marks uh, coinciding with the axis marks. And once this is done, then uh, the surgery is complete. So uh, the complications of toric eye for every one degree rotation, there's a 3.3 degree of uh, lens power which is lost. And for every 30 degrees of rotation, it can cause a complete loss of cylindrical power. And excessive rotation can actually induce additional astigmatism. Uh, so the main theme of these two lenses is always to under-promise and over-deliver. Mm -hmm. Thank you.